Uh, we have coming up the Indigenous Science Panel. It's a matter of trust. Uh, we have seven panelists today. Unfortunately, one of them is missing, Craig Tucker. Can you explain to us why that is? Yeah, so Craig Tucker is a longtime uh, partner of the Karuk Nation and has been a lead negotiator for the tribe on the Klamath Dam removals. Uh, and there's um, a last minute, very exciting and important announcement being made today at 1.30 related to uh, Klamath Dam removal and some agreements that have been arrived at uh, by tribes in the Klamath Basin and Oregon and California as well as the owner of the dam. So we're going to let Craig deal with that very important business, yeah. um, but we'll look forward to that announcement. And I think we've still got an incredibly diverse and strong group of folks here. Yeah, and that announcement is taking place at 1.30. So if you're interested in checking that out, uh, we have as panelists, um, Charlie Reed, Doug Nieslaus, John Moore, Michael Vey, Michelle uh, Cope, Sky Augustine, and our moderator will be William Atlas. So we're really excited about this panel uh, and diving into some of indigenous science, indigenous knowledge, and science in general, combining both, right? The tradition of having a, a both sides in the conversation is important. Yeah, exactly. Indigenous people hold deep generational knowledge of their homelands, of uh, ecological systems upon which they've depended uh, since time before memory. and so. Um, you know, science is, is being strengthened through the participation and leadership of Indigenous people and that's really what we're here to highlight today. So it's exciting to be here. My name is John Moore. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University up in um, British Columbia. I'm calling in from North Vancouver, which is an unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the um, Stolo, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish First Nations. I was born in Oregon and I've worked on uh, salmon in their rivers from Oregon to California to Alaska to most recently uh, British Columbia. And um, I'm really excited about this conversation. I've been really sort of privileged and honored to be able to work with different First Nations on uh, fisheries and fish populations. And, uh, and it'll be great to, to listen and learn. Thanks. Raiuki Hootkits, Nani Toyam, Charlie Reed. Hello, how are you? My name is Charlie Reed. I'm of the Hoopa Yark Kuduk people in the uh, Northern California region, Klamath Trinity watershed. Um, most of my work involves the Spring Chinook salmon in the Klamath Trinity watershed. Um, and that is my thesis out here in uh, McKinleyville where I currently reside on Weah territory. And I'm in pursuit of a master's degree with my thesis being the, the advocation for Spring Chinook from an indigenous knowledge perspective. And kind of like what John was saying, I'm very grateful to be in this space and looking forward to learning from everyone up and down the Pacific coast. Um, my name is Sky Augustine and I'm from the Shemanis First Nation on my mother's side and I'm of settler ancestry, um, Swedish and Scottish and Irish on my father's side. Um, and I'm joining the call today from Victoria, British Columbia in the Kwangan speaking lands. And I'm a doctoral candidate at Simon Fraser University. Um, and my research is looking at the experimental uh, reintroduction of ancestral clam gardening practices. So we're basically trying to bring beaches back to life again by bringing people back onto them. And I am so excited to have this conversation today. We're so lucky to um, get to be in conversation with all of these great folks. Uh, hi everyone, thanks. Uh, my name is Mukwes Kla, uh, which in my language means white bear. Uh, my other name is Doug Nislaus. I work as a stewardship director for the Kittis Tuhi Stewardship Authority, and I also work as an executive director for the Spirit Bear Research Foundation. Uh, very broad jobs, uh, mainly focused around land use plan implementation, marine, marine use plan implementation, developing watchman programs, youth programs, and uh, about uh, 10 different science programs right now. Maybe if uh, Michelle has, can introduce herself. Sure, thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, my name is Michelle Kopas. Uh, I am a professor of geography at UBC in Vancouver, which um, is on the un unceded and traditional territory of the Musqueam peoples. And I'm grateful to live and work in this um, space uh, under their stewardship. Um, I study physical geography, so um, I, I come to it as a reader and storyteller of landscapes. I try to read um, climate change into the landscape, how glaciers and rivers and peoples have shaped uh, landscapes over time. 
And I've uh, had the opportunity to work all over the world from icy places uh, in the Arctic to the Antarctic and high mountains in between, and particularly in the um, Coast Mountains and Cascade Mountains of BC, Alaska, and uh, Washington State. And I think Mike Vey is our last panelist who has yet to introduce himself. Yo, super snookus. Yeah, guys. Anisisla Kanukwa. Hey, Taknukwa. Hello, everybody. I'm very thankful we could all be here together in this virtual space. Uh, my name is Kanistisla, uh, and I'm from Healthic Nation. Today, I'm joining you from uh, Honeymoon Bay, uh, Dididat, and Wasanich speaking people's territory. And I'm the Climate Action Coordinator for Coastal First Nations. I'm very excited to be here on a panel with people I consider my heroes. Well, back at you, Mike. Uh, I'll really briefly introduce myself. Uh, apologies for those early technical difficulties and thanks for bearing with us panelists and attendees. Uh, my name is Will Atlas. I'm here in Vancouver at uh, Salmon Nation's headquarters in uh, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish Nation's traditional and unceded territories. Uh, and I am a salmon biologist who over the last decade has um, sort of grown to understand the power uh, of indigenous leadership um, in science and in conservation. Uh, and work closely with Central Coast Nations, including the Heltzik uh, and Kittisu Heihase on a range of salmon related projects in their territories. Um, and so it's really fantastic to be here today. It's a really wonderful group of people and we appreciate all of you making time. Um, so I think if everyone is uh, ready to roll, maybe we'll just kind of launch into the discussion if, if that makes sense. Are we good to go? All right. So I guess my first question, the way that we're gonna structure this today is I'm gonna pose some questions to the entire panel. I'd like to sort of let them go around. We'll take our time. Uh, we're not rushing. We wanna hear everybody's perspective and their insights into this um, rich topic. Um, so I'll pose questions to the entire panel. As we go, I may pose questions to individuals or to groups of individuals with sort of unique perspectives or experience um, that can help illuminate this um, field of indigenous science. So the first question to the panel is, what does indigenous science mean to you and why is indigenous leadership in science powerful and important? Don't be shy now. I can go ahead and take initiative here. Um, so growing up, I feel like, you know, the impacts of uh, boarding school and just forced assimilation really prevented me from having the ability or access to um, learn my traditional language. And although that wasn't my first language, I know that indigenous science was my first science. So like being like some of my earliest experiences being at our different ceremonies and just being engulfed in that and also being well rehearsed into our um, practices such as fishing. Uh, those are some of the early experiences I've learned like the importance of observation and just being in, in relationship to the natural world and even further like into the spiritual world. And so indigenous science, now that I've kind of come into my own, um, come into my own from an educational perspective, it's been probably my most influential perspective is my experience growing up. Um, I kind of rely on that a lot. <clears throat> and then I actually enhance my way of knowing by getting a Native American studies degree at Humboldt State. Um, taught by some local native women who just really opened my world into how impacted and how um, strong and resilient my people have been and continue to be. So when I'm in all these different spaces that academia provides me with, I just feel like indigenous science is just kind of my, my ace card. You know, it's something that I've always able to pull out and just like really make myself feel good, but also get that message out there to the folks who, who kind of missed out on some opportunities, if not just are interested and want to learn, you know? So I think indigenous science is the solution for everyone because I know everyone wants to restore what has been taken from us, but you know, we, we need each other, you know? So that's what I think indigenous science means to me is the solution. I love that definition, Charlie. Um, one of the definitions that I often come back to and is a favorite of 
mine and, and some of my students um, is one from Gregory Cajete. And he talks about, I'm paraphrasing here, but he talks about um, native science or indigenous science as being the way of understanding and experiencing and feeling the natural world. And I really like that definition because I think that it speaks to some of the um, elements that non-Indigenous scholars who um, are drawn to natural history um, also connect with. I think it also speaks to the way that our lands and waters are able to talk to us and teach us if we're prepared to listen. Um, and I think it also, within that I see um, the importance of connecting to uh, the spirit world, um, which is within our lands and, and within our territories. I, I really, really love what Charlie and Sky have had to say so far and, and uh, it's not such a big question, so I'm, trouble, I'm trying to, to put it in a, a single sentence, but it, it, sort of building off of what Charlie and Sky said in the simplest terms, I think it means uh, working towards a deeper understanding of our relationship to our Wakatus, our relatives. Uh, all of our relatives are, are human, non-human uh, in this world and in other worlds. Uh, and using this understanding to create a sustainable and just future for, for everybody and all future generations and, and, and bringing our worldview into that process as well. And what Sky was talking about and those feelings and emotions and how the land is willing to teach us something if we're willing to listen and we're not just there to ob simply observe two phenomena and, and, and compare them across each other. It just simply doesn't exist that way. And so that, that perspective and the indigenous leadership, I think is important in that process because indigenous peoples are interwoven with their territory and all the beings within it. And that's been that way since time immemorial. And so, you know, in that perspective alone and including that in, in your, and that longstanding relationship into any process, but especially the scientific process means that we're gonna ask the right questions and we're gonna you know, use this information in a just manner for all future generations. Doug, I'm interested in your perspective. I know we've had a lot of conversations about science, especially salmon science in the last few months. And, you know, I, I actually really have appreciated the way that um, you often sort of question the assumptions of scientists in terms of the sort of value that we bring to the table and the knowledge system that we sort of um, propose as a solution. And I, I guess I'm really interested in your perspective on indigenous science um, and whether that's the right term or kind of how you see science fitting into um, this big picture of indigenous knowledge and conservation and stewardship. Yeah, I do question all scientists. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just joking. I, you know what? I, yeah, this is this has uh, been a very interesting uh, topic in my community. I know when we first started science, uh, it was very controversial. It, science was a bad word here because science was always used against us. Uh, people would make decisions and uh, you know, a lot of resource extraction decisions that were based on science. And so when these scientists would phone us and say, uh, we want to come up and study why bark is brown or why the sky is blue, uh, the elders would say, no, where the hell's your science gotten this? And, um, and they would, uh, you know, they just wouldn't trust it. And so when I was hired, uh, my job was to help build a marine plan. Um, and one of the first things we started to do is started to uh, use science to fight science, but not just any science, not just Western science, uh, to combine that with traditional ecological knowledge and local knowledge and merge that with Western science. Uh, and there's a wealth of knowledge, uh, you know, in our communities on the ground. We have gumboots on the ground that are, are out there collecting the data. The best way I guess I can expl explain this is, I remember one time I went to a, a conference and it was called the International Marine uh, Conservation Congress. And uh, there was a big debate going on with all these professors about, uh, and the session was, how do you merge TEK with Western science? That was the discussion. And it was a big debate about it. And um, and one of the professors got up and said, uh, you can't because how do you tell fact from fiction? What's real, what's not? And there's all these stories and legends and, um, and this one elderly lady stood up and she said, um, what, is, what is science? She said, science is observation over time. 
and who has the best experience with that is the indigenous people. And, uh, it, you know, we've been here, we've been here for thousands of years and we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot to share. Uh, and to me, that's what we're doing is we're uh, harnessing all of that. I would say more often than not, we're going to those uh, tables now um, armed with a wealth of information and uh, uh, have won many court cases as a result. So um, leave it at that, thanks. That's awesome. Thanks, Doug. I mean, curious to hear from John and Michelle, you know, as scientists working in academic spaces, you know, how does Indigenous science feed into the work that your labs do? Uh, and how do you understand Indigenous science in the context of the work that we do as researchers uh, within universities or government agencies? Yeah, I mean, I what what everybody has said thus far completely resonates with kind of my perspective and evolution um, and existence and experience within these silos of science and how I would describe indigenous science to, to feed off of what Charlie and, and Sky and everyone is saying is, you know, science is not just observation, it's also inferences. It's how we actually then take those observations and put them into our worldview and based upon our lived experiences. So it's fictions as well. There are no, you know, the, this notion of like separating fact from fiction. For me, it just, it, that doesn't resonate in my personal experience. And maybe it also speaks to, you know, my experience of science has been as a spiritual journey as well. I was attracted to trying to understand landscapes by growing up in the mountains. I grew up all over the world, but I spent a lot of time in the mountains of Switzerland. And for me, it was that experience, that, that spiritual connection to the place that, um, that brought up the questions and the quest to both understand these systems, to build relationships with more than human kin, with the landscapes and the water. Um, so I see this practice that indigenous science is just better science. It's just a, a more comprehensive understanding of what we're what we're trying to do and the value of bringing indigenous leadership and participation into these silos of scientific practice in academia is really breaking down these barriers, is allowing for uh, all the voices to come to the table. It means bringing all the stakeholders to the table and finding commonality and, you know, in purpose, in the language that we use and the values that we're ascribing. Um, and it means elevating both new and ancient ways of knowing and thinking and being. Um, so that's what, that's kind of how it resonates with me. And I feel like, you know, my, my purpose in this, in this endeavor being in an academic institution is to open up the scientific, the, the scientific community's eyes to what is lacking when we don't take an indigenous science approach. Yeah, and sort of taking off our blinders and, and really letting the observations of place and the people who know it best inform our work, I think too, right? John, what are your thoughts on this? How is indigenous science shaping your lab at SFU? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, it's really um, what people are saying really resonates with me and it's really exciting to hear. I think as somebody who's non-Indigenous, I don't think it's really my place to define Indigenous science, but I can sort of um, speak, I guess, to my perspective in terms of collaborating and trying to do science that works well in partnership with Indigenous communities and people. And it seems to me, like, as others have said, um, there's a real need for science that isn't imposed on a place and isn't imposed on a people. And I think that's been the case in the past, right? Where there, as people have said, you know, science has been used to really drive colonial agendas and drive resource extraction. And um, a Maori author, Linda Twee Smith writes, scientific research has been implicated in the worst excesses of imperialism. And we still see it today, frankly, you know, you read any that's a generalization. You read some environmental assessment reports and they're filled with hundreds or thousands of pages of quote unquote science, but it's being driven by an external agenda. And so to me, you know, I think what we're talking about today is science instead that arises 
from a place that arises from a people that arises from that sort of interconnected intertwined fabric of people and cultures and ecosystems that's arisen from millennia and i think that's sort of what we're trying to do at sfu is to not waltz in and say oh we're going to study this why the sky is blue <laughs> as doug said um but instead really try to listen and try to understand is you know can we be helpful can we sort of work with people and can we sort of help um you know, think about the system and, and bring some of our perspectives to the table and, and help elevate uh, what we're thinking about with that place. Thanks, John. That's really, that's wonderful. Um, so this, this question, I think, leads sort of into the next question, which I'd like to pose to the group uh, as a whole. And that is, how has the acceleration and intensification of environmental change in the Anthropocene changed your thinking about the role of science and indigenous knowledge in sustaining ecological and human communities. And maybe we can, um, yeah, just sort of, uh, if somebody's ready to hop in and, and sort of tackle that one, um, go right ahead. I'll jump in. Oh, I think about this a lot um, because I think that you know, our communities and our territories are facing some of the biggest challenges. Uh, and so we really need to be incredibly creative um, when we're tackling those. I kind of see the answer, or I, I see kind of two major pieces. So one of them is learning from the past um, because our communities are incredibly innovative um, and have experienced lots of environmental change. And so, um, I'll give an example of um, clam gardens in my community because clam gardens are intertidal features. They're intertidal um, gardens for clams. And <laughs> there's a rock wall at the low tide line. And there's very limited amounts of time that we can work on and harvest um, from these piece places because they are often covered by water. Um, and now I'm using this example because the clam gardens that my um, community that I work on are uh, many thousands of years old. And so um, we're talking about rock walls that are as old as the pyramids. Um, they're third, and they have been continuously used and continuously managed by our communities um, for that entire duration of time. And for the past 11,000 years in my territory, relative sea levels have been rising. And so um, what we see are these incredible adaptations where people have been continuing through generations to be building up um, these rock walls so that these gardens can continue to survive in the face of environmental changes that occur over millennia. And now the challenges that we face today, some of them are gonna happen stepwise, some of them are gonna happen more quickly, but they're similar. And they're also incredibly local and our communities have are equipped, have, have thousands of years of observations and intuition and experience adapting to these exact kinds of changes. And so I think like my first answer is I think that we need to be trying to learn from our ancestors um, and, and bring some of that wisdom into the ways that we are operating today. Now, the second, my second answer is I think that we need to be finding ways to draw on all um, of our I call ways of knowing. So, you know, I think that there can be a role of in, up for Western science in here too, um, because we have there, you know, we have climate models that are able to predict what kinds of changes our communities can expect. And so how can we weave together um, some of the lessons and wisdom from our ancestors and from our elders um, in the past and bring those um, into our young people? Um, and now I think like, one of the final pieces that I'll say that I think is really important when we're, when we're talking about this is that I, I think that in order to address the um, kind of intensification and, and rapid changes that we're facing, we also really need to check our own relationships with, um, with the land and with the natural world. And we need to be uh, rebuilding those relationships in a, in a really real way. Um, 
And I think that that is a reckoning for all of us. Absolutely, thank you, Sky. I think you said a couple of things that really like struck me. One was that, you know, indigenous people are innovators and they've been adapting to change for millennia. And though the way that those adaptations have worked and the knowledge that underpins them is really fundamental to our survival as a species. So I think that's an incredibly well-made point. And that you said, you know, we need all ways of knowing. Uh, you know, we're in a crisis with earth systems and we need all hands on deck. So um, let's all get together and do that. Um, you know, who, who else has some thoughts that might spring off of uh, what Sky shared or the question that I uh, initially posed? I can kind of piggyback off of that. There's a lot of similarities in what they had just mentioned and really profounding kind of um, examples. I really appreciate those hands-on examples. Um, it just really brings me to your space and what you all do up there. Really awesome type of thing to kind of experience. And I, what I was thinking is similar, you know, like how important it is for indigenous communities and people to be not just like cooperating and like collaborating with scientists but leading the charge because like you know most native peoples come from place-based religion meaning like their very own wealth social wealth cultural health comes from practicing an everyday engagement with land management and you know a lot of times when we think of fisheries management you don't really think about upslope management such as low intense burns like that was a, that that was a a crucial tool that was taken from us in these kind of um, colonial times. And although we have the right to practice our religion, we don't get to manage our land because the Kudu tribe didn't get a um, reservation and the it was just unratified. And that obviously came to an end and we weren't able to ever get those land management rights. But what we are seeing in these last couple of years is the collaboration with the Forest Service and other nonprofits and private entities coming together and reintroducing fire to the landscape, which is awesome. I think that's protecting the futurity of um, the land, the fisheries, all the, like the people who are actually able to practice that essential role and responsibility. And so when that's, you know, the thing about that though, <clears throat> is it's not necessarily public land, it's just private property owners. And so there's kind of a systemic kind of racism to that when most of our native peoples are in position to have access or even have the ability to purchase their own land. So by that, it kind of marginalizes us even further, but it is good. We're all very supportive of that process, but there's just that work to be done. And so when you have catastrophic fires, such the ones that we've been having this year in particular, it's just been kind of further hurting our fish, further hurting our uh, fisheries, which in turn hurts our people. Um, coming from a dip net fisherman family, my my dad, my brothers, and myself haven't been at, we've caught a total of 15 fish this whole season, which is just not okay. Um, there's times when I was growing up that we'd catch like a hundred in a day. And that was just some of the best moments of my life. And now that we don't have those, so many kids don't get to get that like connection to place, connection to community, connection to culture. And so their social and cultural health is kind of taking a hit. And so I think how that could be accommodated is if we move forward and start restoring access and land management practices to the land, to the fisheries, and our elders know what practices need to be restored. We just need the autonomy, the infrastructure to support that because we live in a world now where unfortunately we do need to kind of make a dollar because that's just the world we live in. And so there has to be some type of compensation that will get people to show up and be well rehearsed and, the, and get trained and get well rehearsed and what that looks like because we've been there's just been so much um, disruption that we don't know the what that looks like from a traditional perspective especially when our forces have been mismanaged for hundreds of years so it's not going to be the same as we would do in a consistent routine so there's that curve that we essentially need to get back to but there just needs to be a little bit more support from our um, allies who really want to do well we just need to kind of execute what that process might look like. Wow, Charlie, that's the resilience of your community really strikes me there and the commitment to your land base. I mean, um, talking about the fires and their impact on the whole Klamath Basin, it's like everybody is experiencing in some ways the sort of upheaval and dispossession of uh, their home that the Karuk have been experiencing for the last 200 years. And 
I think we can all learn from the example that you just gave us in terms of, you know, that stealing our commitment to stewardship, that stealing our commitment to partnership, that building a bigger tent that we all uh, have a role in and where Indigenous leadership is empowered. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear other sort of examples of uh, how, you know, we need to mobilize, how we are mobilizing Indigenous knowledge and science in response to this accelerating environmental change. Mike, you, you're working on climate change uh, with Coastal First Nations. I'm really curious to hear your perspectives on some of this too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to follow up with such beautiful words and statements from Charlie and Sky, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, with the, uh, the acceleration of the Anthropocene, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's a unique um, experience, I think, for somebody who is in the early stage of their career um, because in a professional manner, I've only existed in late stage Anthropocene. And so I, this is, uh, this is, uh, kind of like a shifting baseline for me to see how the, this is, it's almost been panicked the entire time I've been actively applying myself beyond school. Um, but that acceleration in my mind has only reaffirmed the need for indigenous worldviews and putting that into all of the different efforts that we have on salmon, on climate action, on clean energy, on, on whatever it is, the worldview that comes with implementing that work and getting those projects off the ground is, is an important first step to making sure that we're not just creating a next bundle of projects that um, can be good headlines for, for government, uh, but actually are effective in making sure that we create a just and, and sustainable future. And so um, with, my, with my work in particular on, on climate action, it's kind of a, a transition for me personally, since I, I did a lot of my work, mostly in land planning and salmon work um, in the first few years of my career in school. But I, I saw this opportunity to work on uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction within the coastal First Nations communities as an opportunity to implement what I was seeing, which is that intensified greenhouse gas emissions are doing harm to the ecosystems that I care about. And so I'm going to try to tackle this on the emission side as well, while continuing to do some of the land use planning and indigenous protected areas work that I do as well. And so I went into this with this natural curiosity of how does this work? You know, these human systems, these energy systems become indigenized and, and it seems I'm not as familiar as, as what those processes are. But it's been really interesting to see uh, because this this whole climate action network is community based and it's community. It's got a community approach where we um, have climate action coordinators within each nation that are actually doing the boots on the ground greenhouse gas emission reduction work. We just kind of get out of their way. They're the real heroes of, of getting this done. And we knew that that in order to be effective, that it couldn't be a top-down approach. It couldn't be saying that, you know, here's this program, here's what we're gonna do, you know, do as do as we as we say. But we came to the to the to the floor with here's what we want to do, here's our plans. You know, right from the bat, what do you think? What's realistic for you and your communities? And so they've been able to adapt it to be considered of their own uh, internal nations, organizational structures, uh, their nation's needs, and also being able to recognize when greenhouse gas emissions and energy systems uh, wasn't the priority and when we need to we need to shift when it comes to climate action. And so it's been a really, really um, fruitful endeavor to be able to see how these climate action coordinators or community base are able to, to say and guide us on, on what we need to do in terms of climate action. And so one, kind of one of the more uh, prominent examples I think is easiest to, to think about is how um, that community based, based approach can indigenize this work. Uh, for example, I think one of the most prominent ones that I can speak of is that we were looking to install um, heat pumps into a lot of homes in communities and to replace the uh, the, uh, the heating oil systems that were in homes that were either non-functioning or just incredibly energy intensive. And so um, the way that it came about is that naturally in community, uh, it was elders that got the first uh, shot at these installations and getting them in homes. And, and this was never mandated. This was never something that we that we said, oh, the elders should get it first. It just happened. And, and that's just one example I think is the most prominent to me that you know, their indigenous values of community and, and elders and taking care of them first uh, even in something as as um, you know different in, from my worldview as as you know or, or my previous work as installing heat pumps, that indigeneity still kind of came into the picture. So I was really inspired by seeing that, and, and I'm really new to this process, but it's it's kind of uh, opened my eyes to how it doesn't matter what you're working on. There's an opportunity for indigenizing it, especially within community. Um, we also have a, a community-based approach to creating community energy plans, and so. I'd support the climate action coordinators to 
understand the processes of building a community energy plan, but at the end of the day, you know, it's coming from them and it's coming from their own communities. And so they're the ones carving out their sustainable energy future. And so it's been, it's been a really, uh, really uh, a gratifying experience to kind of step out of my shell of what I'm used to and, and try to take this opportunity of, of what I saw as climate action and being able to see how it works. So it's been really, really uh, rewarding so far. And as I mentioned, you know, we, we, uh, we're open to the network expanding into different areas and what these climate action coordinators want to do when they hear the words climate action. And so, although we have a greenhouse gas emissions focus uh, and reduction through energy systems right now, we've already talked about and already supported areas of uh, working on food security, uh, physical adaptation projects, and, and salmon restoration. Um, well, you know that, that piece um, fairly well. And I think this just sort of speaks to the holistic nature of the worldviews of the climate action coordinators and what we're trying to do at the Climate Action Network. You know, we're not sitting there and saying that's not our mandate. You know, let's let's just let's just push that outside of somebody else. You know, we're like, okay, like let's talk about that. You know, we want to include that in this work. You know, let's bring it in and, and let's make sure that we can we can build off of some of the other momentum in community and, and make sure that our our general goal of climate action is being met. And so you know, we're 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 in our third year now and I'm really excited to see how it shapes up. We're, we're really getting a sense of what the team is and where we can go. And so I, I'm uh, excited to see how we can continue to uphold uh, this indigenized model of climate action and expand to the other areas. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. You know, you spoke to this holistic view. You spoke to a community-based process. I think those things, you know, really resonate with me, but I think really re resonate with all of our panelists, if the nodding heads that I see here uh, are any indication. Um, Michelle, I'm curious for you in terms of your work on sort of landscape change um, and, and climate in BC, how are Indigenous perspectives shaping the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, I can hear a couple, there's a couple narratives that I'm hearing from, from all these stories that uh, others are telling that um, kind of resonate with the work that I'm kind of trying to do, which is to shift perspectives of what this Anthropocene is and means and kind of um, uh, deconvolve the power that it holds of scientists and earth scientists and you know archaeologists and anthropologists in the traditional western science canon to kind of dictate what these notions of time and acceleration are. Um, and one of the narratives that I'm trying to um, just uh, amplify and get out there is, you know, as Charlie spoke to, uh, you know, uh, notions of, of landscape change and um, kind of uh, resource management that, you know, these are, these are constructs that have only been engaged with over a hundred years, right? It's only been in a hundred years that they've, that management has been, you know, resource management has taken the form that it has. And it has so it's perpetuated so many unintended consequences, right? Um, and to speak to Sky, you know, story of the uh, clam beds um, and those histories that of, of uh, place-based knowledges that have evolved over thousands of years. And, you know, um, just getting, people to think beyond the immediate past, you know, to think beyond that the, the great acceleration is the only direction that, um, that humanity can take, that society can take, like the, you know, the, these, these ways of, of, of knowing, these ways of thinking that seem that they've been set in stone um, has only been a hundred years in the making and people have had other ways of thinking and setting things in stone and adapting in and communities that have been living on the edge of similar crises that maybe um, have evolved over a different kind of uh, construction of time but are still as relevant and as needed for us to engage with today. So I kind of think about how the Anthropocene can or this notion of the Anthropocene and, and the changes that uh, more and more, you know, as, as the conversation evolves around the Anthropocene, more and more voices are coming in and saying, you know, you're not looking at this aspect. Like the Anthropocene started when Europeans came and dictated how 
you know, we need to relate to the land on Turtle Island and um, how we can, you know, so that, so that's one powerful narrative and how do we decolonize that approach, right? And how do we actually um, learn from our ancestors and, and gather their, their, their stories and their knowledges and, and um, kind of find a new path, right? We need, we can't use the, the tools that we have had before. The master's tools are not going to dismantle the master's house. So we need to bring in more voices to the table and elevate them. Oh, thanks, thanks, Michelle. That's really powerful. And what you spoke to in terms of time horizons, you know, I was having this realization yesterday with Olivia, you know, my people, a lot of mine come from the British Isles originally. I was looking at a picture of Scotland and I thought, there's not a tree left there. Like my people left there because we ran out of trees. We had to come over to North America and get them. So I think you're absolutely right that the time horizons uh, and the assumptions that go into our sort of um, epistemologies around resource management uh, are very recent when it comes to sort of European colonial um, institutions. I'm curious to hear from Doug. I know he's he's been um, helping lead some work uh, in Kitesuhehe's territory around applying indigenous law to resource stewardship and taking that deep time perspective. Uh, Doug, could you maybe tell us a bit about that work and how it's impacting the way that uh, Kitesuhehe's um, steward their land base? Yeah, thanks. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I would say this has really shaped, uh, you know, a lot of our work uh, moving forward. I think just thinking about all the changes now, I think solidifies our position that, uh, you know, you have to merge Western science with traditional ecological knowledge and somehow that has, you know, there needs to be a marriage. I would say Western science has done a relatively bad job at incorporating uh, First Nations uh, into any work. And uh, that's uh, one of our missions. And I also should say it's not just about collecting science or it's not just about publishing a paper on TEK. Uh, you know, I think that needs to be uh, paired up with a politician and uh, we need to get to work on some of these. And I think we really need to indigenize some of these policies that are out there. Uh, First Nations have never been involved in, uh, you know, the policies. Um, a perfect example is the Wildlife Act uh, that was developed in the late 1800s with no First Nations input. I mean, that was developed by hunters for hunters with very little conservation value. Um, and that's 2020, uh, we're just starting to engage First Nations now. And so, um, you know, uh, I really want to, you know, a big strong focus is that, you know, there's Canadian law, there's British Columbia law, but there's also uh, Indigenous law, there's Clem 2 laws, there's practices that we've always lived by. And uh, we want to continue to share those values because we believe that those values will help, hopefully to help protect all British Columbians and all Canadians. Um, I think other models have been really based on resource extraction and ours is based on uh, taking care of stewarding. And uh, that's why we developed our own land use plan, our own marine use plan. Um, and we developed a model we believe that uh, everyone will benefit from. Um, and so I think the more we're, we're able to share um, some of these, I mean, something that really scares me about the science front is that uh, you get all these shifting baselines. Um, and I always remember when I was uh, a tour guide in 1999, I remember standing in the river with one of my elders. And I remember saying, holy shit, there's a lot of salmon in the river. And there was a big black line of salmon down the middle. And um, this elder straightened me out and said, this is a fraction of what it used to be. Um, he said, in my lifetime, you could walk across their backs and the wildlife were everywhere. And now, uh, 2020, I look at that same river, there's very few salmon, but a scientist could come in and say, holy shit, there's 5,000 fish in this river, but not understanding that historically that river used to have 80,000 fish. And so, um, you know, I think we need to merge, find a way of merging, um, you know, science and, and uh, TEK and LEK. And I think more schools and universities are starting to look at doing that. And, uh, you know, to me, I think that's where you're going to get a wealth of information. Um, but again, I also think that we need to pair that with some of the policy side and really get involved in, in things like the Wildlife Act and, and uh, going after the policy and management legislation. Um, I think that's where we need to go. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not just about doing science for science's sake. It's about connecting it to outcomes and you don't do that without policy. Um, I want to turn now to some questions from the audience. So we've got a bunch of questions here. I'm trying to sort of filter through and make sure um, that I can actually read and decipher them. There's one here that I think is really relevant to what Doug just uh, broached. And it is, uh, it says, are there ways uh, indigenous science can be misapplied or where bridging quote, Western science can go wrong 
outside from being used for resource exploitation. Um, curious to hear from everybody on the panel. John, do you have any thoughts on that? We haven't heard from you in a little bit. So the topic is the potential misapplication of those connections, is that right? Yeah, and also uh, I think cases where, you know, bridging quote unquote Western science can sort of lead to unintended consequences or where maybe the idea of even bridging or melding indigenous knowledge with science isn't the appropriate sort of framework to understand it. So we'll start with John and then we'll kind of work through the rest of the panel because I want to hear everybody on this one. Yeah, I think um, a couple of thoughts pop to mind. First of all, I think it's important for, you know, I'm a scientist and one of the things I learned when I started trying to work in VC is how I need to really check myself a lot and really need to think about, am I, should I be here <laughs> and should I be working here and I, am, and is this the right thing? And so I think that's a case where it's really important for sort of academic scientists to have a little bit of, um, a reality check about whether or not they're actually helping anything or whether they're just sort of taking resources and just sort of extracting information and then using it to write their papers and publish it in their journals and then get their academic pats on the back. And so I think, you know, one of the potential risks is extraction, extraction information, extraction of, of knowledge for sort of the academic pursuit in, in that sort of weird system of rewards of writing papers. So I think that one, that's one thing that really pops to mind. Um, I think again, as one of the themes that really I'm hearing that really is exciting and resonates with me is, is really thinking about integration and really thinking about um, you know, integration of science with people and integration of ways of knowing across disciplines and across sort of, um, you know, that sort of scientific questions to the application of those questions into policy. And so I think that's another place where um, there can be good consequences, but if people waltz in without sort of understanding the context for what they're doing, understanding the sort of context of how those data they collect might influence ongoing negotiations or ongoing policy movements, there's a potential to do harm and, and to really, uh, yeah, accidentally, uh, hurt the good work that people are doing. Sky, Mike, Charlie, Doug, Michelle, anybody else have some thoughts they want to add to this? I think there's such an important conversation to be had about the sort of power dynamics and the relationship, frankly, between science and indigenous people. And um, certainly I don't have all the answers, but I'm hoping that, uh, that collectively we have quite a few. So I'd love to hear what other folks think. Yeah, I, I think it can go poorly when the sort of subconscious intent is always for knowledge extraction from Indigenous communities. One of the, one of the most prime examples I can think of is the environmental assessment process for the Site C Dam, where nations were asked for their local knowledge on, on the, community, on the uh, local ecosystems and, and areas of cultural importance. And it seemed to seldom do anything about the decision being made. It was more so just a, a documentation process for, for getting this information uh, simply to understand what the impact was going to be, but not actually changing any outcome. And so not being willing to actually first hear the information that you're getting, but then also acting on it and changing your, your intended outcome as a result, I think is something that can, can be harmful is that it's, it's just that it feels more like an exercise rather than something that's actually going to be utilized and the knowledge that you're gaining by having access to this information is going to be utilized is one of the one of the greatest harms I think that can that can be done. I think also it can go wrong with not being able to see, I think Sky, you put it perfectly, seeing Indigenous peoples as innovators and almost doing this process of applying Indigenous knowledge as like a historical context and trying to hold Indigenous peoples back in time. And so by saying that you've done one interview or one segment or one process of getting this information that you've gotten all the information that the nation could give you because it's all based in the past. And so there is no opportunity for, for future innovations for, the, for indigenous communities to, to you know, innovate on and be a part of. And so I think that context of, of indigenous people that are part of the path and all of the knowledge that they hold is just a historical context and there's nothing new that's going to be gained is also a great harm that can be done. And if you go into uh, this work with that framework, then I think it's uh, it's something that can be be deeply, deeply harmful. And and my own personal experience working at the um, 
at the uh, the uh, the Quay uh, watershed with Will um, just proved that that we were using a traditional method uh, of of uh, of a salmon weir, but we were using it in a in a modern context. We were trying to create the same outcome uh, with different with different uh, uh, ap applied uh, tools that would typically be used for like a steel weir. But we were still trying to you know enumerate sockeye salmon populations, uh, but we were utilizing indigenous knowledge in a modern context. And so if you were just to simply go through the process and say, this is something that they used to do and then never apply it in, in our current world, then I think that there was there was so many lessons that wouldn't have been learned. And so I think that holding people uh, and indigenous people as in a historical context can be the other source of harm. Such a great point, Mike. Sky, do you have something you might wanna build off of that thought with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mike, I think I like I agree with with everything you just said. And I think that one of the mistakes that I see happen often um, is a bit of a conflation of the of indigenous science or indigenous knowledge with and, and traditional ecological knowledge with data. And so um, and I see like so I find a lot there are it's common within the academy um, for us to be for academics to be tempted to treat um, indigenous knowledge as as data, and we and when that happens, um, I think that there are a lot of mistakes that are made, and I think that gets to some of the um, unintended implications that John was speaking to earlier. Um, and and so I think that one of the things that's really important for us to remember is that we have different knowledge systems, and that those systems include. Um, processes for validating um, our, inf our, our knowledge. Those include processes of accountability um, and those are different within Western science and the academy and they are different in our communities with indigenous knowledge systems. And when we treat indigenous science or TEK as data, we miss out on all of the systems of accountability and validation and um, that are really, really integral to these, no, like this knowledge being true and correct um, and being able to share all of the wisdom um, that it has to share. And so um, I, like, I think that this is a bit like a little bit of a bigger piece, but I think it's one of the places that I see, a, I see us misstepping often. Um, and so one of the processes that I'm trying to engage in more and more is can we allow for parallel processes to exist? So um, can we have indigenous knowledge systems walk alongside Western science or Western knowledge or the academy? And can we engage in independent but connected um, processes of validation, of inquiry, of innovation? And then can we, in relationship, try to inform each other. So through conversation, um, but allowing each of the, each of our own systems to have all of those, all of our own kind of checks and balances that are inherent as part of that. I think that that's one of the ways that we can start to try to address some of the power imbalances because, Will, you kind of alluded to this earlier. We, we cannot pretend that uh, you know, Western science is, is the dominant is the dominant force here. And so unless we're really, really intentional, um, their uh, indigenous knowledge will continue to be subsumed by by that system. And so I think I see this as being kind of by engaging in parallel processes, it can be one way that we can try to um, alleviate some of those inequities. And like, are those processes, are they really sort of the exclusive domain of the communities themselves? Like how can non-Indigenous people um, sort of support and empower those processes of parallel knowledge generation without having it need to flow through us and our sort of, you know, ways of seeing and being? Ooh, that's a great question. I'm not sure that I have all the answers and this is kind of an area that I feel like I'm playing in myself. Um, I, so a couple of the things that I've been experimenting with are um, the power of, so for instance, within academics, we publish, that can be one of, and we go through the peer review process, and that can be one of the ways that we are um, validate and are held accountable um, 
to our data to you know the, the methods and the design and all of those pieces. Um, within my community, one of the practices that we use is witnessing um, because we're an oral tradition. And so um, we, we, we ask people and we pay people to, to come and to remember um, the things that we are talking about, the teachings that we're sharing, um, and, and, and to hold that. They, 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 become part, they become the carriers of that. And they, are, and they are people who hold us accountable to those teachings and, and remind us. Um, when we are speaking out of turn or when we are misstepping. And so um, witnessing is one of the practices that I'm using for some, for some of my work that is drawing on indigenous methods to practice, to kind of embody that type of validation and accountability. That's so powerful, Sky. Charlie, what has your journey in these sort of parallel knowledge systems been like? And I know, you know, your work in molecular genetics and your work as a community leader is interweaving these themes. You know, how are you holding these two systems of knowledge up uh, through your work? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, being a local traditional pr practitioner and being like a, a student in the academic institution, I think that it's just I find myself navigating both the worlds just like as much as balanced as I can. And so I I have this understanding, like I knew what my thesis was basically when I was a little kid, like, oh, what? Like the fish kill in 2002 is something that is still sticks with me today. Like, okay, fish aren't doing good and it's because of these dams. Mission number one, dams need to come down. Mission number two, we need to restore spring chinook salmon habitat. And so right now it's it's a great time to be alive because those are very feasible projects. And so, and there's just so many um, contrib contributors to that process. And I think the way that a lot of um, academics, I think Dr. Kari Norgard has been a pretty influential author coming from the Western science, social science, sociology, that really kind of validated, like some of the folks that just talked about just validating that perspective and not just, extracting the information I think like John was mentioning is more like how do we support empower and validate your experience because at the end of the day this is your homeland like I can't like it's a commitment I think for um, western scientists like if you're going to go into indigenous spaces or any type of marginalized community like you got to be in it for the long run like you can't just come in thinking all right I'm gonna get my PhD spend a couple summers here and then, you know, step my kind of um, my progress in my personal life, like, that's okay, I guess, if you, if that's what your life, like, that's the way it look, works for you. But I think that if you're really trying to honor what it means to, um, to actually listen, engage, and try and help Native peoples, you got to commit your, like, your lifelong work has to be to support them. Like, I don't know how else that you could actually say that you're genuinely helping or supporting people and just being transparent. I don't know if anyone has read Dr. Corey Nor Kari Norgard's book, Salmon and Acorns Feed Our People, um, but she's very transparent in that book. She talks about her stance. She talks about like how she'd come into the come into the community and the community is rallied around here because of her approach, because of how she kind of phrases different things. Like this is like, this is a reality that I, I as a Western researcher have to come into, like I have to be the one because I have these like, these different kind of titles and credibility, like as far as her success in this Western academia to be able to say that this is a reality of them. Like they could easily have a conversation and tell you like, this is what's been happening since contact. But for some reason we're designed to be like, well, where's your sources, like cite your sources, which for me is the hardest thing for me in academic institutions is when I'm writing a paper, like I can just kind of go on a tangent and then the professor like, well, where, where'd you get this from? Like, you got to cite your sources. And it's just like, dang, I'm, I just remember talking to this with my dad or I talked to this with my aunt. Like just different things where I'm like, okay, like it's just like filtering through that. And so I think I'm pretty grateful to be immersed into my culture and my community to where I, I can just be like, I'm in it for the long haul because it's my responsibility, you know? So I think that's how I'd answer the question of like, um, so it's, so the, the information that indigenous people gratefully, graciously 
give folks is to genuinely be there and be willing to be committed because that's the only way you could actually um, properly and adequately apply what they have to offer. Wow, thanks, Charlie. Hey, John and Michelle, I'm curious to hear from you. How is, you know, everything that, that Charlie and Sky and Mike have said, it, it's like resonates so deeply with me in terms of the, for changing our time horizons, changing how we work and really building trust and relationship. But how has your own research practice evolved uh, in the last, let's say 10 or 15 years as uh, your sort of understanding and relationships to indigenous people has grown? Um. So, well, there's two things that really resonate here. And I, I love how Sky put it into this thinking through these processes of accountability. And um, I think that the way that my kind of trajectory within academia has evolved in the last decade has a lot to do with a reconciling of my responsibilities, my responsibilities to the communities that um, who, whose lands and waters I have been privileged to um, experience and to share time with and accountability to and responsibility to um, start to learn what what their what what are their ways of knowing and sharing and validating? So uh, you know, as Sky was talking about, you know, the, the, within academia, and John alluded to this, like you know, there's a coin of the realm. There's a power. There's a power dynamic, and that's around certain ways of communication and privilege of 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 publishing, right? Um, but there are other ways of uh, knowledge transmission and there are other ways of knowing. And so kind of uh, the, the path that I use and kind of the way that I'm framing it is how to practice epistemic neighborliness, right? So how to, how to practice living and being in concert and in parallel, as Sky was talking about, in parallel with other ways of seeing and then other methods that are used and other tools that are used and kind of um, uh, kind of op opening, being op open to, um, uh, you know, uh, perspectives that seem contrary to my own pragmatic experiences. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, resistance to pursuing that within the within the hierarchies of academia and the hierarchies of science. So all these powers and privileges, um, but it's been my personal path to try to to do so. And the way the way that I um, uh, have you know the way that I've started to explore this is is and as, as others have alluded to, you know, not, um, not equating traditional ecological knowledge or tradition as, as finite, as only existing in the past. That tradition is uh, a, a, an ongoing practice. It's an ongoing in, innovative space and a creative space. And so allowing for that, that um, the perspective that what you know understanding a a a way of thinking about a space let's say a conservation practice that it, that that was successful in the past does not necessarily mean that it's going to translate into the future so as as michael was talking about you know they thinking through like how do we actually merge the lessons that uh, we're hearing from our ancestors with the lessons that we're seeing in front of us, seeing as we are living in a time of shifting baselines. And the, the, the present is no longer the key to the past. The past is no longer the key to the present. We need to be kind of combining and creative, creating and innovating together. Um, 
And so that's kind of the way in which I'm approaching the communities that I'm working with is sort of uh, gaining, um, building relationship before, uh, building relationship is the first step to building and, and sharing of histories and also sharing of, of the, the present moment. Um, and the and the creative and collaborative space that we can find. Yeah, just to um, build on that. Thank, thanks, Jill. That's amazing. I think my sort of path over the last decade or so has has been. Um, you know, I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to do better. And I think you know we still make mistakes and we still don't do things as well as we should. But I think when I first started, um, you know, I thought the way that you did science was you read textbooks and you read the scientific papers and you talk to the professors and that tells you what matters and that tells you what's important. But, um, you know, upon moving here and visiting some places and you're like, oh, I'm here to study the fish and the bugs. And then, um, you know, <laughs> talk to indigenous leaders and like, who are you and why are you here and why does this matter? And, and I, it was a great moment of like super humbling, putting me in my place, sending me back my tail between my legs. Like, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know why this matters. And I don't know that I should be there. And so that's where I'm trying, that's why I guess what we've been trying to do over the last decade or so is, you know, instead of asking the papers, is this science what this place needs? Is this science what matters? Is this science what could actually help things in this time of urgent change? Listening to people and listening to the place. And I think that's what we've been trying to do. And, and it's hard, you know, it, the systems aren't, academics doesn't reward some of that work in terms of um, spending the time in the communities. And, and um, but it's been really amazing and really sort of exciting and humbling to be a part of some of those collaborations. Right, and I, I think that's spot on, John. I mean, like in so many ways, uh, academic institutions are playing catch up in terms of rewarding the kind of practices and ways of cultivating research that really create meaningful outcomes and benefits to community and, and resourcing, frankly, those processes and, and ways of engaging that uh, bring everybody to the table in, a, in the right way. Um, you know, I keep hearing some, I, I keep seeing in the chat here, uh, different questions related to kind of youth and their future leadership and, um, you know, how can we uh, work in the schools um, to, to really sort of like make sure that science and indigenous knowledge are being um, sort of held up together. So I'm curious, and I want to start with Doug, because I actually recently saw some pictures of him out in Muscle with a bunch of school kids from their SEAS program. But you know, what role does intergenerational knowledge transfer play in indigenous science, both sort of today and in the future, but sort of looking across that time horizon of that indigenous science has grown through? Yeah, thanks. Well, maybe I can touch uh, a bit on the last question and then also on this one, because I think they're both related. Um, you know, I, I would say for years, uh, I heard in our community, uh, the youth are our future, through the future generations and uh, uh, you know, it was quite a few years ago now, but we did a look around and said, what are we actually doing for youth and how, what are we doing to support them? And, uh, uh, and it wasn't much. And that's why we decided to take a, a bit more of a proactive approach and set up some programs uh, in our community to really start getting them involved. Um, you know, so speaking a bit to your last question, when, when scientists come in, we, the first thing we tell our scientists when they come here is we don't care about your degree, your bachelor's or your master's or whatever. If it's not trying to answer a question, we're not really interested in it. And if you're not giving something back to the community, we're not interested. Uh, and those days are over where you just come in and, and take the knowledge away and nothing comes back. Um, and so we've had a very strong approach where we ask these scientists to come in and build the capacity, train these new young people so that they can take over these projects. 
Um, and I would say confidently right now, we have people in our community that can take over uh, the bear project or some of the salmon work or, you know, the mountain goat research. Um, and it's because these scientists are coming in and training them how to do it. And they're also inspiring a whole whole new generation of, of scientists. I mean, if you were to ask most of our youth now, a lot of them want to be uh, biologists or bear researchers. And so I think that's one of the, the good things that comes out of it. Uh, but we also really try to focus these programs around grooming that next generation. Um, uh, we, you know, we set up a program uh, where we partnered with Nature United. It's called the SEAS program. It stands for Supporting Emerging Aboriginal Stewards. And we have a school program uh, that, that runs all year. And then we have another program. And the intent of these programs are tied to the outdoors and culture. So every day they're getting out and tied to the land, tied to the waters, tied to their elders. We bring on some really cool people like uh, Nancy Turner, an ethnobotanist, or a Survivor Man, or you know people like that. So just to really inspire them and and you know uh, create some new opportunities for them, uh, which is pretty neat. Another program we have is the Stewardship Ambassadors Program, um, and that's tied to this office. It's more. Um, based around culture, stewardship, and a lot of the office responsibilities and the behind the scenes work. So we're trying to get a good mix, uh, you know, and I just think that's really important. We're now, I think, in our eighth year of our SEAS program. Uh, and uh, when we started eight years ago, those kids we had in the SEAS program eight years ago now work for me now in stewardship. And so uh, there are watchmen, there are some other scientists that are out there uh, collecting all the data. Um, there are, you know, in the marine planning roles. And so uh, some pretty exciting opportunities. And that's where we put our focus to build it next generation. Thanks, Doug. Who else has some sort of insight or wisdom to share with regards to the role of sort of intergenerational knowledge transfer and how youth are going to be essential to our success in this uh, endeavor? Yeah, I can just kind of reiterate kind of what Doug was just speaking to. I just grew up as kind of that youth, the next generation, like your generation is going to be who, who gets us where we need to be. And it is a lot of pressure, but it's something that's been cultivated at such an early age for me that it's something that I was always prepared for, whether I liked it or not. I'll be honest and say that there's moments where I'm like, can I just not be that and kind of um, inherited, like kind of that responsibility, can I just kind of forget about it? And when I would, you know, if that just meant like, I'm just gonna go to college, get a degree, Come then you know I didn't want to do too much of that heavy lifting, and then the creator kind of put me back on the path to put me in a position to have adequate and effective um, change. And I think I work locally here at in McKinleyville for Two Feathers Native American Family Services. We work with a lot of different um, families, and we have a very unique approach that is very parallel to like our cultural kind of holistic wellness approach. And so it's a native owned organization that works with what I call at promised youth who really are just going through it. You know, they're having a pretty rough go, just kind of still experiencing the onsets of kind of colonialism for whatever re unique reasons. And a lot of what my role is there, I'm, they call me a youth advocate, but really I'm a mentor. Like I mentor them to cultivate a relationship with their culture. And like I was speaking to earlier, our culture is a lot of like land-based kind of management practices and harvesting, which kind of go hand in hand with management. And so I'm really just trying to cultivate that relationship, kind of what Doug was saying is, you know, kind of um, nurture that relationship so they, they have the access to get into an in internship and really access the, the knowledge that they know. It's just, I think a lot of times in um, school spaces, it's just like, well, you better know your multiplication. You better know these to be successful when really it's like, hey, I've noticed that you're pretty good at woodworking. Like, let's let's nurture that. Let's like, that. let's go for that. Like, there's a lot of push to like be in the classroom for success, but when really like you can go into trade, you know that? Like just different creative, innovative kind of pathways. It's like, school's not for everyone. I don't really like school myself, but here I am, you know? So like, just really being creative with how we approach what each youth could do to kind of get us through these hard times because we always think about the, that seventh generation ahead and I think that's something that I'm just trying to fulfill my responsibility to make sure that I give kids younger than me the the privilege that I've had to have access to my culture community place ceremonies because a lot of the kids that I work with aren't in their homelands you know they're they're out here on the coast 
couple hundred miles away, you know, so I try to, sometimes it really means like I give them a ride up to go to the dances, you know, it's, it's like that type of supplemental support that could really go a long way because that's what it's all about is just putting people in opportunity, opportunity, you know, positions. So that's how I would um, answer that question. Sky, I'm curious about your own work with youth. You uh, are helping restore clam gardens, and I've seen some amazing pictures of kids out there with gum boots on and dirty elbows. And uh, I'm just curious to hear about like how that sort of evolved for you and what impact it's having in your communities. Oh yeah, I mean, our youth are our future. And so I think that, yeah, everyone gets on board with training youth being, you know, the most important thing we can do. Um, and, and I think that that looks like a lot of, in, that looks like a lot of different things. That looks like making sure they can speak the languages of their territory. Um, and it means like making sure that they know the stories and know the names of the places that they're visiting. Um, and that they have an array of kind of skills and tools to draw from, to be able to, um, understand their places and to be able to have the impact in the world that they want to have. Um, more specifically, yeah. So I think like engaging youth is really, really important. And um, as part of that, through the Clam Garden Restoration work that I've been doing, um, science, youth science and culture camps have become really important and youth engagement whenever we can has become um, a really high priority. Um, during science and culture camps, which are probably where some of those photos that you're seeing have come from, um, there are opportunities for students to learn about places um, from a lot of different knowledge systems and a lot of different knowledge holders. Um, and so you might start your day um, hearing language um, and hearing stories, uh, but throughout the day, you might learn from an archeologist as well as a cultural worker. Um, you might learn, you might go on a plant walk and learn about some of the traditional uses um, and medicinal uses of plants, um, as well as from a botanist um, who might talk about species at risk and, and some, of those, some of those things. And so, um, I, and, and I think the days where the days where we have youth out are always some of the most impactful because um, laughter is abundant and curiosity is rampant. And um, I find even adults start to kind of lower their shields and are just a little bit more um, enthusiastic to get wet <laughs> um, and to quite literally get dirty. I want to come. Um, and also I just wanted to provide a quick plug. Actually, I believe it's the next session is actually about the SEAS program where there's two folks from CLEM2 that are going to be talking about their work in the SEAS program. So if you're interested in youth programs and how they're being sort of built within community across the coast uh, and their impact for future generations, tune in and check it out. So we have 10 more minutes and this has been an incredible forum. I could talk to all of you for the next five hours and be perfectly satisfied to sit here in Zoom, but unfortunately we all have other things to do today. So I wanna let y'all go. But before we go, I wanted to pose a question to every one of our panelists. Uh, and that question is sort of what makes you hopeful about the future? And that's really the question. So um, if we could go, uh, I don't know, whoever wants to hop in, why don't we say, um, Mike, what makes you hopeful about the future? I think we're seeing a dramatic shift in the acceptance for other worldviews, indigenous worldviews and creative solutions to our complex problems. And also within indigenous communities, we're seeing our youth rise up to the challenge and taking on the responsibilities that they are inheriting that Charlie talks about. And and they're not easy, they're not light, and it's not um, by any means that they're inheriting a world of stability and, and, and they're coming into a very complex nexus that they, that they are gonna have to, to create solutions for, but they're up for it. And, I, and I've seen 
people who are simply six, seven years younger than me are really empowered to make a difference and really empowered to, to take charge and take lead. And so the youth gives me hope. And, and by some demographics, I'm still a youth. Um, but the people that are that are right below me, you know, they're they have so much energy and they want to make a change and, and in their hands, you know, they can't go wrong. Michelle, what makes you hopeful? Um, you know, I, I would I would just second and amplify what Michael just said. Like what makes me hopeful is that um, I feel like there is a cracking open of, you know, systems are, are, are breaking and shifting in all spheres, in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the ecological sphere, in the social sphere, you know, pandemics are highlighting um, inequities and allowing for that conversation to come into play. And I feel like people are opening up to a seeking of new and well, new to them, new and different worldviews, um, and I think that that's what you know. It gives me hope that we that we we can actually have a radical, re, you know, reordering of systems, a breaking down of you know the academic silos and the the scientific silos and um, you know, a, a re-networking of communities that have uh, been marginalized, but have been, you know, that are really at the forefront of innovation and give, and, and bringing them into conversation, like in this festival, like have, bringing this I mean, incredible group of people that I'm looking at on the screen here. Like we have so much to learn from one another and actually creating this space. That gives me hope. Me too. Doug, what makes you hopeful these days? Well, I'm hopeful because I know Michael V is there. And, uh, um, you know, just young people like Michael, I think, you know, it's just super cool. I think seeing the shift of, you know, the new generations coming up and uh, we have more people, uh, more young people going off to post-secondary, uh, getting the degrees, more people working with their communities. Um, and I think just how strong First Nations have come, I think about where we were uh, 20, 25 years ago, uh, totally different landscape. And, uh, you know, First Nations now, uh, especially within uh, the Great Bear Rainforest are, are super strong. They're very well organized. Um, uh, you know, I think we're bringing a lot of different knowledge, our indigenous knowledge, merging that with Western science and, and pushing uh, the forefront of where we can go. And so, um, you know, nations have been there for 10,000 years and I'm sure they'll be for another 10,000 more. And so um, that's what gives me hope to know that uh, we're just getting stronger by the day, so. Amen. How about you, John? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, you know, the, as others have mentioned, just this conversation is super hopeful and, and it's inspiring. And, you know, the work of Charlie and Sky and Michael and Doug, it's, it's, it's all just is really, fills me up. And I think, um, you know, I think back, I was working with a First Nation on a really controversial um, challenge with a fossil fuel pipeline. And I was talking to one of the leaders and I um, asked him, you know, how, how do you stay so positive? And he looked at me and he smiled. He's like, well, I've never lost. And, um, and it was true. Like he never, you know, he, every battle that they fought, he, he, they'd win. And, you know, there are all these examples of uh, I want to say new ways of doing things, but it's not new, obviously. It's a sort of, you know, re uh, reinvigoration of perhaps old ways of stewardship that are sort of brought into this modern era. And I think these are, you know, I think across Salmon Nation, we still have a lot. We still have amazing places. We have this insanely diverse cultural fabric that's still super strong. And I think, you know, across Salmon Nation, it can be this sort of global example of how to do it right. Thanks, John. I hope you're, I think you're absolutely right. Let's keep working towards that. Charlie, what makes you hopeful? Big day for the Klamath maybe? 
Yeah, yeah. I think everyone touched on the bigger kind of um, things to be hopeful about, you know, the youth, the opportunities that come in these times of try in these trying times. And I think more particularly to my place here on the Klamath River, um, I, I just received word that Warren Buffett is in agreement with the dam removal process. So I think there's going to be a um, kind of a virtual discussion here at 1.30 that I'll probably tune into. This is like some lifelong news coming into fruition. I'm uh, just really hopeful, you know, just brought a life into this world just six months ago and to think that she's going to be living in a time where there's no dams. You know, I never thought I'd live to see the day. So I don't think I can get any more hopeful, happy and um, grateful than that. So, and these spaces are super awesome. I just, I'm really grateful to be in spaces with such brilliant minded people. And uh, thank you all for having me. And I hope we all kind of keep on keeping on because things are changing and I'm glad that we have some powerful people getting to the point where we're gonna make some effective change here pretty quick. Thanks, Charlie. And I'm really uh, overjoyed you're able to join us today and can't wait to hear more about what's uh, happening over the next couple of years in the climate. It's really exciting. Sky, I wanna end with you. What makes you uh, hopeful for the future? Um, all, all of these conversations and all of these projects that uh, these folks are, are leading and that our young people are so excited to start because as we see our systems um, cracking, I think that these are uh, the seeds that are gonna grow up in between those cracks. And, and I am really overjoyed and excited um, by you know, the flowers that we're gonna get to watch emerge. Wow. Okay, well, that's a great one to end on. Thank you all so much. It's been a real privilege to be here with you today. Um, you're all incredible human beings. I can't wait to keep working with you and learning from you and, uh, you know, take care, be well, and uh, do good work, as they say. Cheers. So, Nick. Thanks, all. It's amazing. Go to Hello, welcome back. That was an amazing conversation. It really was such I, a joy to be a part of it. Yeah, I think one of the things that really struck me was what Doug said with the abundance of the rivers that he once saw or once knew or even his like his elders once knew. And do you think that that's something we can hope for in the future? I think so, absolutely. And it's, it's a long slog and I think, um, you know, one thing that I always keep in mind is just the inherent resilience of ecosystems and of salmon in particular and I know that with people like Doug at forefront uh, pushing that fight and demanding more mm -hmm. equitable and biologically sustainable uh, resource management that we will get there again mm -hmm. so it's yeah. something to aspire to and also what Sky was saying that the youth are the future and yeah I think that's a really important part and I love that even the adults can get down and dirty into the water and yeah. involved when they see the youth doing it. They bring us all joy and you know the youth are the future but the youth also deserve to live in a future where ecosystems can remain abundant and support their access to local food and to culture uh, and it's really beautiful to hear what's happening in the Klamath and you know Charlie's yeah. um, anecdote about his daughter being born six months ago and coming into a world where you know their world is is um, in the process of regeneration and rebirth through the removal of the climate dams. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for moderating, Will, and thank you to all our panelists for being here with us today. And I think these are these are beginnings to hearing other people's projects and perspectives and ideas so that we can start working together.